Hi everyone. In this video, we are going to cover section 7.4, the single singular value decomposition or SVD for short. And the section starts out kind of with a brief um, uh, summary that not all matrices can be factored in the form A equals PD P inverse, where D is diagonal. We saw that in chapter five in, in section 7.1. We learned a process by which we can we can factor that matrix A into the product of three other matrices. But what's interesting, not all matrices can do that, but what's interesting is that all, all M by N uh, matrices, they can be written as, oh, as A equals Q D P inverse. So we can factor it into three different matrices, but the first and third matrix are not necessarily inverses of each other. The singular value de value decomposition is one of the most useful factorizations in applied linear algebra. All right, and this what's also again interesting is that this is for m by n matrices. Right, for our a equals p d p inverse, they had to be square. So we'll start with some underlying concepts of what's going on with this singular value decomposition, and we'll write them down. It's based on it's based on the property that the absolute value absolute value of the eigenvalues of a symmetric matrix of a symmetric matrix um, A measure the amounts that A that A stretches or um, it shrinks Okay, yes, I can't write today. It's eigenvectors. Okay, so we're using the language of stretches and shrinks, but typically we think about, you know, it, it scales the vector, right? So we're just interpreting that as either stretching or shrinking. Um, to put that with some technical terms, if AX, A times X is equal to lambda times X, that's our, that's how we define an eigenvector, and we'll say that the length of x is one unit, then the length of a times x would certainly be equal to the length of lambda times x, um, which is, oops, lambda times x, which is the absolute value of lambda, because we have to measure length is in positive numbers, times the length of x, so I'm splitting that product apart, and then since the length of x is 1, this is just equal to the absolute value of lambda. So that's the formal notation for the sentence up above it, uh, and then we'll say, we'll add on one, one additional piece here, if some lambda, if some lambda, there we go, has greatest magnitude, greatest magnitude, then the corresponding uh, unit eigenvector v1, move this up a bit, unit eigenvector v1 identifies a direction direction in which the the stretching effect uh, of a is greatest all right so there is some lambda the largest eigenvector that corresponds to an uh, largest eigenvalue that corresponds to an eigenvector that tells us what direction has the greatest stretching effect via multiplication by my matrix A. All right, now we'll look at an example that kind of exemplifies what I've kind of uh, what I've laid out here. 
So the example, example one, A, we're given a matrix, uh, then a linear transformation X to A times X maps the unit sphere, so that's the set of all X such that the length of X is, is equal to one in R3, onto an ellipse R in R2. And so that's the picture. So we, we start with our unit sphere over here, and any vector inside of that unit sphere, when multiplied by A, gets mapped onto this slanty ellipse. And our goal is to find a unit vector x at which the length of a times x is maximized and then to compute that length and we can kind of see it's over in this general direction but how do we uh, find it with precision all right so let me scroll up so i have room to start writing this problem and the first thing that i'm going to note here is that um, we're going to use the length of ax squared is um, maximized we're going to maximize the length of ax squared um, at the x, and, and we're just noting that it is the same vector x. At the vector x, that maximizes the length of a times x, and it's just easier to work with. This is easier to work with. And we'll see very quickly because the, the next line is why it's easier to work with. Uh, because when I write the length of AX squared, I can uh, rewrite that as AX transpose times AX. If you think um, when we first were introduced to dot products and all that, the length of a vector squared is the same as the dot product of the, two, of the vector and itself which is the same as that vector transpose times itself. Okay, so I'm kind of pulling to doing two different things here. First, we're, we're taking the length square, squared as a dot product and then rewriting that dot product as vector transpose times vector. Okay, so then I can take this new product, not dot product, but regular product, this multiplication, and apply the transpose first. So the transpose of a product is the product of the transposes in the reverse order. So x transpose a transpose times a times x. And then I am just going to rewrite it once more, but with my a transpose times a grouped together. And that sure looks like a quadratic form from the previous section. One thing I want to note here is that a transpose times a is symmetric. So I'm just stating it, but I'll show you why. A transpose times A is symmetric um, because when I transpose it, A transpose times A, right, pause the video and work this out if you want to um, before I do it. This is equal to, to change the order, A transpose, A transpose transpose, which is A transpose times A. Right, so when I transpose it, I get the original matrix. That means it is, in fact, symmetric. And now we want to maximize the quadratic form the quadratic form x transpose ATA times x. All right, so how do we do that? Well, go back and recall what we did in section 7.2. I'll change colors to black. And first, let's write down what is A transpose times A. If you want to do this before I write down the answer, I'm not going to write out the two matrices separately, but I'll just write out the product. Go ahead and pause the video if you want to find that first. But A transpose A is 80, 100, 40, 100, 170, and 140. And then column 3 is 40, 140. And... 200 like that all right the next step would be to compute the eigenvectors i'm just going to write them down for you lambda 1 is 360 lambda 2 is 90 and lambda 3 is equal to 0 we would find them using the techniques of chapter 5 and then again using the techniques of chapter 5 we would find the corresponding eigenvectors v1 is one third two thirds two thirds and in writing these eigenvectors down you'll see that they are um, normalized so they are all have they all have a length of 
one unit, negative two thirds, negative one third, positive two thirds, and V3 is two thirds, negative two thirds, and positive one third. So interpreting that work in this context, the maximum value, maximum value of the length of AX squared is 360, that largest eigenvalue. And it would be when X, when my vector X is in the direction of the V1 vector, the corresponding eigenvector. So if I take A times V1, that produces a direction of 18, 6, and then the length of that vector, the length of AV1, is the square root of 360, or in simplest form, 6 times the square root of 10. All right, so that's the, the significance. And if I scroll back up to my picture here, that AX vector, this guy right here, that is the direction 18, 10, and the length is the square root of 360, or 6 radical 10. That is the greatest distance. That's the major axis. So the length of the major axis of that ellipse is 6 radical 10. All right, moving on to the section. Now we'll begin our discussion. What does it mean, a, a singular value of a matrix? And we'll start with calling by saying we're going to have a matrix A, be M, by, M by N, let A be an M by N matrix. Then we've already established that A transpose times A is symmetric. But it can also, and also we'll say here, and it also can be be orthogonally diagonalized. Orthogonally diagonalized. Uh, so we'll establish some eigenvectors. Let v1 through vn be eigenvectors, or, or actually they're they're an orthogon orthonormal basis. Be an ortho normal basis for Rn consisting of eigenvectors. of a, a transpose times a. So there's our set of eigenvectors, and they are orthonormal. Um, and we'll establish some lambdas also. Lambda 1 through lambda n be its eigenvalues. All right, there we go. There's the setup. Then the length of a times one of the eigenvectors, avi squared, we'll do the same thing as we did on the previous slide, is equal to avi transpose times avi. So that's just some eigenvector corresponding to a lambda i eigenvalue. Um, so then what are we going to do? All right, we're going to apply the transpose just like before. vi transpose times a transpose a vi. And now what I want to look at is this A transpose A times VI. If we have the eigenvectors of A transpose A um, as our lambda 1 through lambda n, then I can rewrite A transpose A VI as VI transpose times lambda I VI. A transpose A VI is lambda I VI. So we're making that substitution because vi is an eigenvector of a transpose times a. And then we can say that this is just equal to the lambda i. And the reason for that is because vi is a unit, meaning has a length of one unit, is a unit eigenvector, or unit vector. Okay, so that's why all we're left with is the, the lambda there. And then the significance, what this means, this means... 
that the eigenvalues, the eigenvalues are all non-negative, the eigenvalues of A transpose times A. The singular values of A are defined, so now we're defining singular values. are the square roots of the eigenvalues of A transpose times A. So because we know that they are all non-negative, we know that we can take the square root of any eigenvalue of A transpose times A. And then they are denoted, they are written as, uh, with, with, the variable sigma. So sigma 1 through sigma n. Uh, and typically, not typically, and they are arranged in decreasing order. Arranged in decreasing order. They are the lengths of ax1, ax, or excuse me, av1 through avn. of a, v, 1 through a, v, n. That is what those sigmas are. So for any matrix A, its singular values are the square roots of the eigenvectors of a transpose times A. So if you think about it, when you find a transpose times A, you're kind of multiplying the matrix A by itself, right? You're, you're kind of squaring it, but not in the re regular sense of, of squaring and multiplying it by itself. And then you find the eigenvalues, and then you take the square roots, like undoing the squaring. And those are called singular values. So in example two, we'll refer back to the, uh, the example one and say that the first singular value, sigma one, is that square root of 360, which is six radical 10. Sigma two, the second uh, singular value of that matrix A, is the square root of 90, which is three radical 10. And sigma three, the square root of zero, is zero, All right? So from the second singular value, a times v2, a times that eigenvector is three negative nine. And then if I look back, look down at my picture here, there we go. If I look down at my picture, that three negative nine, that actually gives me, uh, see if I can put it about where it would be, right there, that is this minor axis on my ellipse. Um, that, that is the, and that's no coincidence. It's the minor axis. And not only that, uh, that three negative nine is, or I'll say, which is orthogonal, uh, to a V one. And that's no coincidence. That's the minor axis. A V two is orthogonal to a V one. And that brings us to our theorem, which I will leave here. Um, there is a proof in the text for you to read through. I'm not going to do the proof in this video, uh, but we're going to be given a set of vectors that is an orthonormal basis consisting of the eigenvectors of A transpose A, arranged so that the corresponding eigenvalues are in descending order. Same setup as my slide previous. And then we're going to say, suppose A has R, so R non-zero singular values, then those uh, AV1 vectors, AV2 through AVR, form an orthogonal basis for the column space of A, and the rank of A is equal to the, that number of non-zero singular values. So in the case of the previous example, the rank of the original matrix A would be 2, because we had two non-zero singular values and one singular value that was 0. And our, our vectors that we got, the two eigenvectors, um, or the two, not eigenvectors, the AV1 and the AV2 vectors, um, they were in fact orthogonal to each other. If we find AV3, you're of course going to get the zero vector. Which brings us to our fancy theorem 10, the singular value decomposition. Before going through that, I'm just going to add on a little bit here. This um, singular value decomposition involves an M 
by n, and then they put it in quotes, diagonal matrix um, epsilon, and that's a capital epsilon, and it is no coincidence that it is a capital epsilon, and we used lowercase epsilons previously, uh, of the form, the form, um, and the, 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 what epsilon looks like is this. It starts with a diagonal matrix D and puts zeros everywhere else. D is R by R and diagonal. Okay, and if my original matrix was M by N, then this epsilon has, that's a little arrow there, has M minus R rows, and it has N minus R columns. All right, so that's what, what that epsilon looks like. It is, in fact, diagonal, uh, but the text puts it in quotes because it has a particular form for its diagonalness. All right, so theorem 10, the singular value decomposition. A is any matrix it wants to be. M by N has a rank equal to R. There is an M by N matrix, epsilon. So epsilon has the same size as A, as in three. So that would be, oh, the, this guy up here, for which the diagonal entries in D are the first R singular values. So those lowercase sigmas are what form capital sigma. And there exists an M by N orthogonal matrix U, and an N by N orthogonal matrix V, such that this product is, uh, is exists. A is factored into U epsilon V transpose. So that's like our PDP inverse, that only applies to di uh, diagonalizable matrices. U epsilon V transpose is applies to any matrix that you want to write down M by N. Our text also has a proof of this theorem. I will leave that for you to read and interpret and understand to the best of your ability. Um, we're gonna go through two examples where we write this factorization. Example three has us use the same matrix A that we have been working with in both examples one and two. And I'll kind of write out the steps as we do the, the rest of this process of you know doing the singular value decomposition or SVD in it. All right, our step one, whoops, our step one is to orthogonally diagonalize A transpose times A. Orthogonal diagonalization for A transpose times A, which we've already done. So if this were a new problem and we will do example four, we would have to do that work to start. Step two is to set up both V and E. Set up V and, and when I said E, I do of course mean epsilon. Okay, so V, the matrix V, consists of the eigenvectors, but the normalized eigenvectors. One third, two thirds, two thirds, negative two thirds, negative one third, positive two thirds, and uh, what do I have? Two thirds, and then negative two thirds, and one third. So that is V, and V transpose it is what goes into the factorization. Then we can write down uh, the diagonal matrix D, although this isn't part of the answer, I'm just writing it down first. That consists of six radical 10, zero, zero, and then three radical 10. Okay, so if you're just using the singular values, that's the size of D, but then we need to to upscale, if you will, to write down our sigma. So sigma should be the same size as A. Same size as A. A was two by three, D is two by two, so I'm gonna go six radical 10, zero, zero, three radical 10, and then tack on a column of zeros. And that's why epsilon is quote unquote diagonal. It consists of, it's made up of that diagonal matrix D, but then we, I, that's my term, that's not something the text uses, upscale it to be the same size as A by adding on uh, that column of zeros in this case. 
right? Once we have step two done, we have our V and epsilon matrices. Step three is to construct our U matrix. Construct U. And the first R columns of U, R columns of U are normalized vectors from AV1 to, AV, uh, to AVR. Normalized vectors from AV1 through AVR. Okay, so my AV1, what was that, like 18.6, I think it was? So then U1 is 1 over 6 radical 10 times 18.6. And that gives me uh, 1 over radical 10 and, oh, nope, 3, excuse me. 3 over radical 10 and 1 over radical 10. And then U2 is 1 over 3 root 10 times 3, negative 9, and then simplified, that looks like 1 over root 10, negative 3 over the square root of 10. Boom. There's your work. So we benefited from already having much of the work done for us. So um, now, uh, step four is you can just write down the factorization. A is equal to U times um, epsilon times V transpose. And let's put it all down there, where U is this guy, 3 over the square root of 10, 1 over the square root of 10, and then epsilon is my 6 over radical 10, 0, 0, 3 over radical 10. Whoops. Oops. And then 0, 0. I almost forgot that extra column of zeros. That's epsilon. And then V transpose. We already wrote down V. Now we're just going to transpose it. 1 third, negative 2 thirds, 2 thirds, 2 thirds, negative a third, negative 2 thirds, and 2 thirds, 2 thirds, 1 third. Boom, and piece of cake, look at that. That that, that looks pretty complicated. Uh, but that is your factorization of A into, um, it's it's called a, what's called its singular value decomposition. We've decomposed A into a matrix consisting of its singular values, and then the U, vec the, the U matrix and the V transpose matrix. Pretty cool stuff. All right, that is the end. That's it for that example. We're going to look at one more example here and then close on my favorite theorem. Example four, we have a different matrix A, finally, a different one to work, work with for the first time in this section. Um, one minus one, two, negative two, 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 negative two. We'll, inter we'll encounter something a little bit tricky toward the end of the problem, but let me just go through the, the same steps as the last example. The first thing we need to compute, A transpose times A, and that gives me a bunch of nines. It gives me, let's see, 9 here, negative 9 here, negative 9 up there, positive 9. Check and make sure we got something that is symmetric. That means you did it correctly. Um, and at any point, pause the video if you want to compute these before me. Um, I'm just going to write them down because these are things that we've already gone through, finding products, finding eigenvectors and eigenvalues, etc. All right, uh, so for that matrix, lambda 1 is equal to... 18, and that corresponds to an eigenvector v1 normalized, 1 over the square root of 2, and negative 1 over the square root of 2. Lambda 2 is equal to 0. That corresponds to an eigenvector v2 of 1 over the square root of 2, whoops, 1 over radical 2, and also positive 1 over radical 2. For both of those entries are the same. All right, there um, is our initial work. V, then I can write down, is the eigenvectors. 1 over radical 2, negative 1 over radical 2, and then both positive. 
like that. That's V. Epsilon, I can write that down. Three rad, um, yeah, three radical two. So I'm taking the square root of my eigenvalues. The square root of 18 is three radical two, zero, zero, zero. So that's the D part of epsilon, my diagonal matrix. So I took the square root of this number, went there. The square root of this number was that zero. And then I'm going to, in this, this problem, add in a row of zeros so that epsilon is the same size as my original matrix A. All right, that's good. Next up, I just need one more matrix. But like I said, we get a little clunky here. Um, a little bit more work for this one. When I find AV1, I absolutely get an answer. That's nice and good. 2 over radical 2. Uh, negative 4 over radical 2. And positive 4 over radical 2. Unfortunately, when I find AV2, I get the 0 vector. That does not mean that I put the zero vector into my um, my U matrix. That would not work out at all. Okay, one thing that we can check here, by the way, just as a side note, that if I find the length of AV1, I should get the square root of 18, 3 radical 2. Right, We got it up earlier. Uh, well, we got lambda 1 was 18, and we used 3 radical 2 in our epsilon. Um, when I find a the original matrix A, Right, uh, let me just point back at things. My lambda one and this entry here, those came from A transpose times A. So when I'm down here, if I take just A times V1, I should get that same square root of 18 or three radical two. So that's kind of cool. Now, let me take my AV1 product and normalize that and we'll call it U1 because it's the first column of my U matrix, one third, negative two thirds, and positive two thirds. Normalize it, you divide by the length. Okay, but I only have one vector there. I need three, technically. I need three because that is the number of rows of A. U has to be M by M, so I need two more vectors there. And what we need to do, how we find those two vectors, is we need to extend the set u1, just that one vector that I've got written there, to an orthogonal basis for r3. So we did, we already had the right number of vectors in the previous example um, from our two uh, singular values. In this example, we don't, so we have to do more work. All right, and what I'm going to first write down is two more vectors, W2 and W3. And I'll first write them down, then explain where they came from. 2, 1, 0, negative 2, 0, 1. And so the way that I came up with that is, well, first I did W2, and I said, all right, I need these two vectors to be orthogonal to each other. So I want this to be times this positive two-thirds, this times this to be negative two-thirds, this times this to be zero. So I chose two, one, and zero so that u1 and w2 are orthogonal. And then I also did the same thing with w3 so that this vector and this vector are orthogonal. Okay, So that was just figuring out what entries to put here so that this dot, this dot product and that dot product are zero. Unfortunately, this dot product is not zero, so we're going to use Graham Schmidt. We're going to Graham Schmidt it. <laughs> oh, that was a good one. Um, I shouldn't laugh at my own jokes like that. Graham, S C H M I D T. Find the orthogonal projection of W three onto W two and U one. I'm not going to show that work. I'm going to jump to the answer because we've gone through the Gram-Schmidt process. We're learning something new and challenging. I don't want to get hung up on the minutia. Um, so if you do that, if you find that ortho that third orthogonal vector, then, ooh, let me add on to that sentence. If you find that third orthogonal vector and normalize them, then U2 is equal to 
my same 2, 1, 0, but normalized. 2 over the square root of 5. Uh, 1 over the square root of 5. 0. And u3 is equal to negative 2 over radical oops, 45. 4 over radical 45. And 5 over the square root of 45. And if you're wondering where the heck the 45 came from, it's from the vector that I didn't write down, where I orthogonally projected w3 onto the subspace formed by those two vectors using the Gram-Schmidt process. All right? So, wow, that was a lot of work, but it allows me to write down my factorization that A is equal to U epsilon V transpose, where U is equal to, let's see, uh, what was my first? It was one third, negative two thirds, positive two thirds. V, uh, the second column, 2 over the square root of 5, 1 over the square root of 5, and 0. Third vector, negative 2 over radical 45, 4 over the square root of 45, 5 over the square root of 45. That is my u vector, or my u matrix, excuse me. Then my epsilon matrix, 3 square root of 2, 0, then a bunch of zeros. And then my V transpose matrix, which looks like 1 over the square root of 2, 1 over the square root of 2, negative 1 over radical 2. Remember, we're transposing the original matrix V that we wrote down, 4 over the square root of 2. And that gets us our original matrix A that looks like 1 minus 2, 2, minus 1, oops, minus 1, 2, and negative two. And I think, just as a side note, how cool is it that the epsilon matrix only has one single non-zero entry, and all these other matrices are filled up with entries, but that one single non-zero entry is, you know, that that does all the <laughs> that does all the legwork for us. It's the singular, singular value for that matrix A. Cool. Now there is more um, content in section 7.4. This is this slide is as far as I am choosing to go. They get into different applications um, of SVD of that process. Um, you don't need to worry about that. We're going to close it up on the invertible matrix theorem. We almost get through the whole alphabet. U V U V W X. Right. If A is invertible, then all these statements are equivalent or uh, all these statements are equivalent to A is an invertible matrix. A has N non-zero singular values. The row space of A is equal to Rn. The, the, per, the orthogonal complement to the null space is Rn. The orthogonal complement to the column space is just the zero vector. So this last topic allows us to add on more to our invertible matrix theorem. We're just going to add these on at the end here without a proof necessarily. That is the end of what I want you to get out of this section, but you can definitely choose to read through the rest if you would like to. Thank you very much for listening. Have a fantastic day.